and this is so this is also a tool to to reset your your adrenaline level basically you know um, okay questions about this and how does it relate I know the answer but how does it relate between adrenaline and cortisol then I don't know Extra. you tell me no. <laughs> <laughs> because of stress like uh, adrenaline goes up when there's a stress situation yeah and if adrenaline if the stress situation doesn't go down cortisol takes over and cortisol this is something you don't want and this is what this is what causes eventually burnout because if there's cortisol too long yeah. then you'll be uh, fatigue you have adrenaline failure uh, ad adrenal um, gland failure yeah so um, this is why this is why it's very important that you don't want to go into the cortisol you want to you want to just shortly but then also always come back to um, to to this this um, Base level. Base yeah. level. So, so um, if you have for a longer period of time too much Stress. adrenaline, then it becomes yeah, cortisol. Because adrenaline is only to make you fight or flight. Yeah. yeah. And cortisol is to. Yeah. And this is then the sympathetic yeah. uh, system working. Yeah. Can I ask oh, a basic question? So, when we, were we talking about a 30 40 breath, why is it 30 40 not? 20 or 60, what does, how does that matter? And well, how will I know what's enough for me? Okay, yeah. Feeling. That, that last how question is good. That first, <laughs> the first question, why 30, 40, why not 20, 60? My, my answer would be, why not? You know, like, but the second question is good. Like, how do you know if it's enough for me? Basically, when you become dizzy or a little bit too dizzy, it's your time to breathe out and hold. And it can be, you know, like, and 30, 40 is, a, is just a great average. Mm -hmm. But because since... I've noticed that I, I don't get dizzy on the first round. It's like I have to do it a few rounds and then I... Yeah, get the mm -hmm. same thing on the second round. Yeah, not on the first round. So does it mean I'm not breathing? Well, I know, I know, but does it mean that it's not deep enough breathing? No. So your question is... Um, I get dizzy on the second round. I th I think because I, I'm not totally sure, but I think because your body is still acidic from sleeping, and um, what I believe is that this dizziness comes from a shortage of CO2 and therefore a shortage of O2. So as long as your CO2, your your body is acidic, there's a lot of CO2 in your body, and this is why you don't become dizzy. And I explain that now. Okay, O2, CO2. So this is O2. Ooh. And this is CO2. So in the venting phase, uh, and there's there's like three parts. There's the, the lungs. Yeah. Lungs. You say what phase? Venting, like vent, 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 venting. Oh. Venting, venting. Okay. Breathing yeah. phase. Breathing. Breathing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, yeah. <laughs> the there's fainting. lungs. Yeah, the fainting phase. There's the, the blood. <laughs> fainting. There's the blood and there's the muscle tissue. Yeah, it's three parts. Okay, if we breathe in, we get oxygen in. If we breathe out, we breathe out CO2. You know, like mm -hmm. more. So in the breathing phase, the O2 goes up and the CO2 goes down. That's clear, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then if we hold our breath, we breathe out and hold our breath, then the CO2 slowly goes up, like gradually, like here, and say, because of CO2 you want to breathe again. Yeah, so if there's, the CO2 is high enough, it's like this is triggering your breathing uh, behavior, you want to breathe in again. Nothing to do with O2, which is interesting. But your O2 is dropping, like plummeting even. So your O2 goes here to an, to an oxygen rate and, and like the, the oxygen meter that I have here is measuring the blood. Yeah, so we talked before about maybe that um, the, 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 the machine doesn't measure correctly and it can be more than 100% but it's basically if it's in the muscle tissue you don't measure it in your blood anymore. We're going to test this by the way, we're going to put it on, on Ellie's finger when we do the breathing and then afterwards I'm going to show you a little film like what actually happens. 
So we can check what I what I say now. <clears throat> and then this last phase is like balancing everything out again. You know, like getting back to normal. So a few things are happening. Let's talk about this phase first. We remove CO2, we breathe out CO2 from the, from the lungs and we breathe in O2. So it gets to the blood first. So CO2 is removed from the blood, O2 is added. And CO2 is removed from the muscle tissue and O2 is added. It's pretty logical. But there's this funny thing within our body, it's called the Bohr effect. Anybody heard of it? Me. Okay, cool. <laughs> so the Bohr effect is that if the CO2 level in your muscle tissue is below a certain level, it cannot take up oxygen. So when we're breathing faster and faster and you know, like keep on breathing, at a certain moment the CO2 level is too low in the muscle tissue and there's no oxygen getting in. So you get both a shortage of CO2 and O2 in your muscle tissue. And this is where you become dizzy. And this is where you can get the cramps from. It's like a lack of CO2. So the blood is like fully oxy oxygenated, but in your muscle tissue there's a shortage of, of uh, oxygen. And this is very interesting because if that happens, there's like a, a temporary crisis in your muscle tissue and some hormones are released that make more red blood cells because you need more oxygen. It's, this is what your body is thinking. And this is the biohack where you where you basically create more red blood cells and they take up more hormone, um, take up more oxygen because your body thinks it's in crisis. And this is how you store more oxygen in your muscle tissue and that is what makes you stronger or better stamina or alkalizing effect and whole uh, everything. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. Um, any questions? I don't know what to say, so it's so always a good moment for questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to ask. <laughs> 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 That's a good question. Uh, well, can you tell us more, uh, maybe about uh, how how does the breathing impact, let's say, your gut system? Because he was talking about this this morning. Yeah. Okay. Question: How does the breathing impact your gut system? Well, I have a strong gut? feeling that. What do you mean with gut? Belly. Yeah, the, the digestive, digestive, digestive uh, system. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There's there's like two answers. So what happens normally after the, after the breathing, yeah, because most of us are a little bit too much in our sympathetic, so after the breathing, and you've measured that, you've measured your breathing frequency, you can breathe slower, right? So that means you're more in your parasympathetic, more in your meditative state. And um, <clears throat> what was your question? <laughs> I think I can answer it. I think I can answer this question. System, how can it All right, yeah, so if you're more in your parasympathetic, your digestive system is more activated. So that, that is one answer. And the other, you know, like how do you, how do you, um, if you really know how to breathe through the belly, you massage your gut and that's, that's, that's always good for, um, for like healing your gut or, or whatever. And you probably have something to add. Yeah, uh, it's, it's been proven that when you do the exhale, a longer exhale out, you stimulate the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve connects the brain to the stomach. Yeah. So that's that's very interesting. So we have in our in our brain we have like three kinds of brains. The, the first like uh, oldest part of the brain is called the reptilian brain. Mm -hmm. And then we have like the mammal brain and then we have the neocortex which is the human brain. Now the vagus nerve is is directly um, coming from the reptilian brain so like your your um, um, yeah, the oldest part of your brain, the most central part, and it's a very long nerve that goes through all your body and it ends in your gut, <clears throat> right? That's right. Now, by engaging your parasympathetic, you engage the, the vagus nerve and this calms you down. So, it sounds a bit weird, but engaging the parasympathetic is like going more into your meditative state. Um, and that is, you know, by breathing out longer, you know, like if you breathe high and fast, <laughs> this is like fight or flight continuously. Well, if you take <sighs> deep breath to the belly, you know, you massage your belly so that's good for your gut, but also by extending your exhale, you have like, you go more into your parasympathetic. 
But is it a good idea to do like the day's breathing after eating, for example? What do you feel? I would say no, but I'm not sure why. <laughs> well, you know, like if I, you know, if I overeat, it doesn't happen a lot, but sometimes I overeat and feel like pfft. I would do like really calm, you know, very slow Wim Hof method style, but not puff away. So I have exactly the same feeling. You know, mm -hmm. you don't want to do this after dinner mm -hmm. because basically, because your digestive system is is working, you are already more in the parasympathetic. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, after dinner dip, basically. You know, mm -hmm. you you become a bit tired because because you want to. Um, Should we do the the ice cold bath prior to the breakfast? Like we just ate breakfast then it was jumping uh, to the ice yeah. <laughs> it was ice bath should it be yeah theoretically better? yes yeah definitely you know like okay. after dinner you want to do stuff like this listen to boring scientific uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, things <laughs> relax your jaw relax your jaw Okay, so the question, I'm just repeating your question. So when is the best time to do the breathing? Well, before breakfast in the morning, but you know, like that's any practice. Mm -hmm. And I would add, whenever you do it, you are a hero. So if you don't do it in the morning and you do it in the evening, it's already good. And if you have like a problem, either physically or mentally, I would just breathe, you know, like my gut out. I don't know if that's an expression, but you know, like I would do it like, uh, five times, ten times, I don't know, just as much as possible. There is no maximum here. And then I had uh, another another uh, good question. Uh, this was in Mexico, a very, uh, an old woman that was very critical. And she said like, yeah, well, that's all fine, you know, like if you want to uh, alkalize your body, you should do this breathing, you know, if, if your body is too acidic. But what if it's too alkaline? And then I didn't know the answer to it, but if it's too alkaline, you just want to breathe out and hold your breath. And automatically, because the CO2 goes up, it will uh, make your body a little bit more acidic. So I guess in a sense, you get to the point that you revise the whole class the first day. Like, get to know your body, and your body will tell you, like, when is the right time to do this. Because, like, you can put it in theory, yeah. but basically, Experiment. Each, yeah, experiment because each of, each of us body is different. So Definitely. Mm. See what works, right? Yeah. Definitely. Does the breathing work without the eyes? No, it's not a stupid question. It's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, yes. And do you need to do the breathing before the ice bath? No. It's like you can see it separate, you know, there's a lot of signs about cold training and, and a lot of separate signs. So these are, you know, we're talking about the breathing now, but it, it, you know, you don't, there's like two connections between the breathing and the ice bath. And one is because you alkaline your body, you alkaline your body because you put, you remove the CO2 in the end and you add O2 and it goes to like optimal. So if your body's too acidic, you alkaline your body and alkalize your body, excuse me. By alkalizing your body, because if you do like three, four rounds, it's already 7.4 is the pH level of our, of our blood. And like, yeah, we have this theory about uh, alkaline diet, but you cannot really change the acidity. It's between 7.35 and 7.45, average 7.4. 7 is neutral, 7.4 is slightly alkaline. So our body has to work to keep that alkalinity, basically. If you do the breathing, it, ra it rises to maximum 7.8, I believe. You know, so like a full hour of breathing, your pH level of your blood is 7.8. This is because there is a, a more O2 in, in your blood and in your muscle tissue and less CO2. And it takes about you know, like uh, one to five hours of so you breathe for for an hour is like three to five hours for it to go to normal level. And this is how how sporters use it. You know, like if you're going to run a marathon, you can at home do like a full hour of breathing and then get to the the start and pick up your number and wait and start running. And it's still you know like you it's still um, working basically. 